We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks for being here. My name is Jamil Jaffer. I'm the founder and executive director of the National Security Institute at George Mason University's Anson Scalia Law School. I'm thrilled to be here with a great panel uh, talking about extending cyber defense across America, lessons learned uh, for regional, state, and, and local actors. So I'm joined uh, today uh, by three amazing uh, panelists. Uh, we'll start uh, immediately to my right. Uh, Kelly Moen serves as a CISO uh, for the city of New York. In that role, she leads the Office of Technology and Innovation's New York Cyber Command to protect, defend, and respond to cyber threats across the city. Prior to her appointment as, the New York, as New York City's CISO, she served as a CISO for the, police, the NYPD. Um, and prior to that, she was a division chief of the Department of Homeland Security. She also served on the FedRAMP Joint Authorization Board um, as a technical rep to the CIO, providing subject matter expertise on securing cloud technology. So Kelly, thanks for being here. Amelia to Kelly's right is Alicia Lynch. Al Al Alicia. 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 I knew. I know. I always get it wrong. I feel so bad. Alicia and I've known each other for a long time, oh, right. and I still, I still manage to mess it up. Apologies. No. Alicia Lynch brings more than thirty years of intelligence, security, and cyber experience uh, to our panel today. She retired as a colonel from the U.S. Army in 2012, where she served as both an intelligence and a cyber officer. Uh, she led teams all the way from team size uh, operations to commanding a brigade. Uh, she recently held titles including uh, the CISO at Cognizant, a, a Fortune 200 company, uh, also at SAIC, uh, the Deputy CISO at Accenture Federal, and VP of Enterprise Solutions at a cybersecurity startup. She's also an active member and supporter of many organizations, including the Washington Zex CISO Council, Zoom CISO Council, MVTC's Cybersecurity and Privacy Community of Interest, where she and I have worked closely together on a number of events. And last but certainly not least, to, to Alicia's right, is Aranga Kahangama. Aranga is the Assistant Secretary for Cyber Infrastructure, Risk and Resilience at the Department of Homeland Security. He previously served at the White House and the National Security Council as Director for Cyber Incident Response. He was the principal author of Executive Order 14028, Improving the Nation's Cybersecurity, one of the leading efforts in the government to improve our nation's cybersecurity. He also saw the federal government's response to the Solar Winds attack. To China's exploitation of Microsoft Exchange servers and ransomware attacks on Colonial Pipeline, JBS Foods, and Casilla. So thanks for being here, Aranga, as well. So, folks, what we thought we'd do today is, since we have a small group, we'll just jump in. I'll have some questions for uh, for the group, but you guys should weigh in with your questions. We'll definitely have time, um, at, you know, in about 20, 30 minutes for you to ask questions. But if you have questions along the way, just put your hand up, you know, and jump in. We'll, we'd love to take your questions and keep it interactive. So I'll start with you, Aranga. So, you know, as we think about the Russia-Ukraine conflict, right, uh, the government did a lot to prepare our allies in Ukraine uh, for what they were likely to face from Russia. Um, but we also were protecting ourselves here at home. We were hardening American infrastructure out of concern that our support for Ukraine might lead to Russian attacks on the United States. So talk to us about what DHS and CISA did to strengthen our defenses at home, what you all did with our allies overseas, and how that effort went in your mind. Sure, no problem. First of all, thanks to Jamil and NSI for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be here and enjoy uh, the conversation with my fellow panelists. Uh, you know, I think when we think about Ukraine uh, and what we did, I think there's two angles to it. I think the, the, the broader, more important one is figuring out what we actually learned from the Ukrainians themselves. And what, frankly, we've learned is that resiliency matters, that defenders can actually defend themselves from an onslaught of cyber attacks, right? There's a very much a hot cyber war back and forth in Ukraine uh, from Russian aggression and uh, critical infrastructure in Ukraine uh, is, was, was not um, surprised by this. They have been facing these attacks for years and years. They doubled down on their defenses. They were able to repel a number of attacks. And so I think they are the, the, the core example of uh, at the ground level, at the infrastructure level, cybersecurity defense matters, it works, and it's where the rubber meets the road with these national security conflicts. More, more broadly at home, you know, at DHS, we underwent a whole of government um, a campaign. DHS was named the lead federal agency by the president for homeland preparedness and defense. We went on a campaign from a cyber perspective called Shields Up, where we were engaging with infrastructure owners and operators across the country, putting out information, making sure that information was specific. If we needed classified uh, briefings, we were bringing in folks for classified briefings, DHS is able to read folks in to one-time read-ins and have security clearances. Um, so we did, I think, a pretty good job of showing the nation and showing its critical infrastructure owners why this matters, how to elevate the baseline of cybersecurity. And I think, to my point on Ukraine, we really showed that if there's conflict, geopolitical tension, regardless, 
the U.S. is going to get involved. It's not just a military-to-military conflict. It's not just yeah. the Department of Defense or Homeland Security that are going to be threatened. It's the operators, the frontline uh, men and women that are that are operating these pipelines and uh, you know other critical infrastructure pieces. And so, really, when we get into conflict, just as you know, a soldier would be on the front lines of a war, critical infrastructure owners need to realize that they are also someone on those front lines. So, Alicia, as you guys were thinking about, you know, what was going to happen with uh, with the Ukraine war starting to heat up and we saw the Russian forces there on the border, there was some discussion about whether it might happen or might not happen. But everyone sort of did assume that if it happened, there would be a cyber component, right? There was a question about how much would be there in Ukraine, how much might come to the United States. But thinking as a global 200 company, how did you all... How did you all approach the potential threat? How did you work with, with government? Um, and how did you all think about it both here in the United States, but also overseas? Mm-hmm. Yeah, re- really good question. And, um, you know, spending so much time in defense, you're always focused on geopolitical type activities and yeah. things that are going on. But n- not that I, I did never think that from a private sector perspective that it would be impactful, right? So mm. a lot of things happened during that. First thing I was, brought into Cognizant because they had an incident prior to me getting there. So I was Mm. heads down, busy, hardening and doing all the things that I needed to do to help, you know, recover the company and everything. This is when you started with Cognizant. That's when I started. Yeah. yeah, And it was, I'd only been there for like six or eight months before all this started happening. Right. So I was like, I'm shoveling away. And then all this Ukraine thing starts to hit the, hit the, you know, screen. And I'm like, oh my gosh, start shoveling faster because we need to like get some hardening done. So really just focus on the basics a lot. What wrong it talked about you know just the basic cyber hygiene things but the things that what came to light through the um, conflict was that we had not cognizant employees but we had like third-party providers who were providing us different types of uh, services coding and things like that straight out of the Ukraine right so then we had to immediately drop into our planning around you know business continuity plans and what are we going to do if they get impacted and they can't provide any of their help so then we had to you know, I, I looked in at the BCP plans, and yeah. a lot of them were just That's business uh, continuity. Business continuity yeah. plans looked in there, and a lot of them were just, uh, you know, paper like NA. We don't need one, right? So, Is that right? Yeah, there were things like that. And I'm sure at, at a lot of companies, yeah. that, you know, I've talked to a lot of CISOs, and it was the same way, right? Who'd have thought that something like that was going to, you know, going to happen and would impact your ability to provide services to your yeah. customers, right? So so that was the first thing, and I'll, I'll just give you like, an example, like after it had gone on for a while, we, we, we definitely had um, backup plans and we worked that out. So, but things we didn't know how it was going to heat up across all of Europe. So we were looking at all of our other big, uh, where were our big contracts and customers at and where were services delivered. So we like, we looked into the front, into France, right, where we yeah. had a lot of people there and we were looking at what's the BCP plans look like there. And they were all like, oh, we're going to back this up to India. And they were like, France required me to speak French to these customers. So like we got people in India. So you just learned, we learned a lot of things, yeah. right? And we were so fast to um, rec- recover from that and to really put together solid plans yeah. you know, on the move. And uh, it, was, it was all like being in the military, right? Your first plan goes to hell in a handbasket and then you got to get in there and really look at your other branch plans. So yeah. we did a lot of that. Yeah. yeah. Kelly, I mean, you run you know, you run defending the, the the infrastructure for the largest city in the United States, uh, probably you know the most important metropolis in the globe. How do you? How did you all think about the threat coming out of the Russian conflict? How did you think about it at, at the at the city uh, and state, local, regional level? How did you work with? Did you work with the federal government? Did you work with with the localities around you? What did you all do? And and, and do you feel like it was successful? What could you have done differently? Yeah, so I think, um, so great point about New York City, it is big, we have a very large attack surface. Um, We either directly or indirectly support all the critical infrastructure sectors, all 16. Um, And resiliency really isn't a a new topic for New York City. Um, Cyber Command, New York City Cyber Command has been around since 2017, but even before that, post 9-11, the Lower Manhattan Security Initiative, the idea of coming together for the greater good is really core to the, I think, the culture and the heartbeat of New York City. Um, and so what's, what's been interesting about the, the ongoing protracted conflict is when, um, when it you know, perked up, yeah. um, determining very quickly this is going to be a sustained engagement. And so we have internally a process called a significant external event, which could have cascading events or impact to our operation or any tentacle of our operation across the, our New York City agencies. There's about 100 plus 
agencies, employees, some of the similar concerns, how would this potentially something going on over overseas impact our direct operations. And through that significant external event, we do heightened, um, heightened monitoring in a number of different areas to make sure that if we are seeing new tactics or new yeah. campaigns, that we're able to immediately put those protections in and then also share things like hunt packages yeah. and tuning best practices um, as we see them. And I think what what I really benefited from, and I think all the stakeholders in the surrounding community um, benefited from, was a lot of the early messaging that was coming out of the CISA and even the White House. I think for the first time, you know, I think ever, we saw emerging and almost not on the fly, but definitely earlier notification about this is this is real, we are seeing attacks, protect yourself, yeah. shields up, and we've never been shields down right. since. And I don't think anyone is going to ever be shields down, but I think yeah. that campaign alone, the concept of shields up, really resonated at the SLTT level, the state local um, territories, because it's it's something that everyone says. Oh, I have a f I understand yeah. f the physical notion of shields up, even yeah. though it's in cyberspace. And so that really, I think that it, it's a messaging campaign yeah. that really helped stakeholders understand the importance of it. So let's talk about shields up for a second. So you you noted that since you know since nine eleven, at least if not before that, New York's never had its shields down, right? Yeah. But you know you wonder whether other states and localities can keep their shields up. Private sector companies like Cognizant and the like. I mean, can they keep their shields up forever? How long can they sustain this higher operating uh, pace? And if, if the answer is no, what is sort of shields medium, right? Or sort of you know shields at normal level look like? It probably isn't where it was before this conflict. What, what does it look like in your mind? So I think I'm a big um, when I do planning or sort of drop into teams to figure out how to do things for extended periods of time. You're always thinking about what the sustainment level looks like yeah. and what can you do in the sh you know short term versus long term. And I think rolling some of those ongoing heightened monitoring becomes day to day operations with well defined playbooks and and an eye towards that resiliency, right? And I think if you go in with that concept, because you are in essentially protracted engagement potentially with a threat actor, you, you've you got to be able to ensure your team's not burning out. You've got to be able to yeah. ensure you're getting the resources that you need and you're able to articulate those accordingly. I will say across other state um, state and local municipalities that don't have potentially the budget or the, the sort of the, the resources behind, right. It's imperative that everyone is taking advantage of like the good work products that are coming out of CISA, the, the tuning guidance. We certainly partner with yeah. our the municipalities across in other states to share as part of public-private partnership, yeah. including the private sector, to say what we're seeing because we're so big when we see a campaign and share it. Yeah. Most of the time, we're helping the next person because they've caught it before yeah. or they're at least better positioned for it yeah. and, and vice versa. I think it's a small t sort of tight-knit community yeah. in SLTT in that way. Yeah, and Iran, are you guys seeing sort of any sort of fatigue like that? And if so, like how are you, it sounds like it sounds like Kelly and the team are seeing the, the value of the products you guys are putting out. Um, are, are you thinking about stepping that up to help make up for the fatigue? How, how is how's that relationship in your mind gonna work? What's the best, what sort of steady state look like going forward, you know, it, in terms of shields up and, and those sort of defensive campaigns, knowing that this threat's gonna be out there for a while, not just from Russia, but China, Iran, North Korea, and then every, proxy, right, that operates for these countries as well. No, I think that's, that's very true. I mean, I think we had very active discussions in the early days, even uh, several months after about kind of like shields up fatigue, right? Yeah. And making sure we're not inundating folks. And I think uh, one, you know, I think the value proposition that we as a department take on is that we need to provide the most actionable intelligence and information possible, right? There's only so much of telling people generally to use certain controls or to right. do MFA. I think the more granular we're getting, the more specific we're getting to actually give defenders something to tangibly look for, yeah. I think is really important, right? You see our products coming up with like references to the known exploited vulnerability list or you know patching certain specific instances of software vulnerabilities, things like that are definitely more, um, more active. Um, we're also trying to make things easier. Yeah. We are good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's say power stillers, uh, there's TVs. Um, I think to Kelly's point earlier, we also, one lesson learned from Ukraine is the value of making sure everything is unclass. Yeah. You know, I think the White House led by example, they were declassifying a lot of intel. We took uh, notice to that too. We tried to scrub down indicators as much as possible, even if they were anonymous, but given with spe enough specificity to remediate. 
we wanted to do that. So we are, most of our information sharing through private sector partners is uh, on class and we try to commit to that. Yeah, so let's talk about that actually. So uh, Alicia, so, you know, one of the things that Iranga talked about was this idea of, you know, uh, providing the information, providing actionable intelligence, right? Um, from, from where you all sat at Cognizant, um, how much of that actionable intelligence did you guys see coming out of the federal, state, local, regional governments? Did you, were you getting a lot of actionable intelligence or was what you were seeing sort of stuff you already knew about and that was there? Um, what, what, how, how did you see it sort of as this, thing, as this thing played out? Yeah, so really good question. There's actually around three different sources that we on the private sector side get yeah. our intel from. It's from the cybersecurity organizations we're talking about, the ones that he represents and, and others. Like, yeah. um, I'm, I'm a big fan of FBI. Yeah. Um, they have their DSAC, which is their Domestic Security mm-hmm. Alliance Council, yep. which is um, it's something that they do for companies like Cognizant. Mm-hmm. That's uh, the top you know, 200, 500 fortune yeah. companies. And they have representatives geographically located with your company headquarters, and you get to know them. Like, okay really get to know them and they are constantly providing data as another source mm-hmm. from your organization they provide that type of threat intelligence as well there's also you know vendors big vendors like yeah. Microsoft and sure. Palo Alto and those kind of companies they have their own threat intel feeds and they're all it's it's all in an ecosystem it's just how do you get it mm-hmm. to to be able to use it and make it digestible to your environment and then there's your you know pure play uh, you know uh, threat intel companies that are platform companies like yeah. Intel 471 and Mandiant, Kevin Mandy is like sure. the Phoenix, Mandy comes up with a different company all the time. Well, it's the same company, but you know, I mean, it is, great capability. It is amazing you can sell the same company twice three for a billion times. dollars, right? Exactly. Three times, it's pretty it's amazing. CEO, it's a good, right? it's a good move, yeah. yeah. He's, pretty, he's fascinating, he's really good. So there's all these different ways to get the Intel, and we and we thought, it, I've seen it getting better and better. I was an Intel officer in the military. Right. I saw how we had to break down these walls to get everybody to work together. And I think that it's getting better and better. Yeah. It really is, I think it's a true, Truly, everybody understands that you have yeah. to do it, and then also the, you know, declassifying of data so that it's useful data. No sense yeah. in getting it in a report after it's and you can't use it, right? Right. So, so I think that was um, it was it was all very helpful. Um, what's what's what I think the challenge is on the private sector side is you know coming from government, you know, there's a lot of resources. I know there's limitations there on that side, but from the private sector, you're you're paying for everything that yeah. you get, right? And so you get all these threat intelligence feeds, and it's really great, but you have to know what your own environment is, and it's yeah. massive. She has a massive environment. Cognizant was massive, 350, 80,000 people, yeah. different kinds of businesses. It's almost like running multiple medium to large companies all fully together, and when you get all these notices of the CVEs and the threats that are out there, you have to know what's in your environment to know, is this even going to impact me? Do I even have that right. product or or whatever it is that's being impacted. So that's the hard part on the on the private side is understanding what is your threat, what is your whole landscape look like, and what are the threats that are trying to get at you, and what way would they vector into you. So yeah. there's a lot of analysis that has to go on, and companies just really don't have the money to invest in doing that. Yeah. So uh, I'm lucky. I was from the defense, so I had that background. But it's really it's a it's something that we need to look at, you know, in this country about how do you get the threat intelligence you need and tailor it to your environment so that yeah. it becomes actionable. So, so yeah, so let's talk about that. I mean, how do you, how do you, I mean, obviously you're in a, you're in a large company, you know, Fortune 200 with so many, with, you know, 300,000 people. How do you prioritize investment in this space for your board of directors? How do you, I mean, do they, do they realize how important it is? And if they do, are they willing to invest the money it takes? Like what, how do you, how do you make it a priority? Is it a priority for boards at this point in, in your mind, what you've seen? Yeah, I think that, um, I think it definitely is, and there's a lot, you're seeing it get better and better for boards to get people who understand, you know, security on yeah. the board so that they are holding you accountable, you know, as a functional to do what it is that you need to do to protect the company, right? So I do think that is the case. I think that um, there's a lot of companies talk about their um, enterprise risk management. We do enterprise mm-hmm. risk management. We prioritize yeah. this, and we, we balance things against, you know, where do we invest our money and where do we don't or where do we take the risk, right, based on what do we think is going to happen. I think there's a lot of talk around that at, at companies, at least all the companies I've been in, it's been, a, you know, the board talks about it, the, the staff talks about it, the, the senior leaders talk about it, but I really don't think there's good practice there right. because you really have to do that because yeah. there is not 
an infinite amount of money, right? Yeah. And as far as um, you know, you ask the question like, how do you how do you use your resources? Well, I was coming in, and I always work, you know, outside in. Anything external facing, you got to shore that up, right? Right. And that's a big deal. So obviously, your your perimeters and your segmentation, micro segmentation, and all that stuff yeah. that you need to do. And identities are so key, right? So having a handle on that type of stuff. So I just walk the dog on that kind of a story to the board, and they're super supportive. Yeah. They really are because nobody ever wants to go up and say, "No, we're not going to do that." Because now yeah. you're on record saying, "Oh, right. we're going to do that," and then something yeah. happens, right? So right. you typically, you know, I think CISOs are not we're not extravagant. We know it costs money, and I think we really try to just do what's important yeah. first and prioritize it. So Kelly, I mean, you, you know, in New York, you must have a ton of sources for information, right? Yeah. You must get feeds from everywhere by all the sources that 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 Alicia has, right, um, and the like. But you're also, you know, you're getting information from the federal government. You're mm -hmm. sharing information with the federal government to inform them. But you're also working with your localities around you. How do you all think about information sharing? You mentioned that you guys put together, you know, mm -hmm. tuning packages and and the like. Um, how do you get it out? How do you get how, how are you getting it in? Yeah. How good is what you're getting in? Yeah. And how are you getting it back out? Great question. Um, so when it comes down to it, like Alicia mentioned, there's a lot out there and very easily it can become noise. And yeah. so making it, um, abstracting sort of the noise out and so it's actionable is the number one priority. Yeah. Um, that requires a significant amount of automation and also having really sharp staff that understand cyber threat intelligence and the actual life cycle of, of curating. Yeah. What I call what we do is essentially curated insights that can be directly actioned by yeah. The operators at sort of any any stage of um, orchestration, right? Whether or not we own the infrastructure or passing to a partner, yeah. this is this is what you're looking for. This is how you're hunting, um, and those those partnerships um, have proved incredibly valuable. Because typically, like I mentioned, if we're seeing something, our partners are seeing it. And yeah. so being able to send that so that when folks receive information from us, they know oh, this is real. I need to focus on this. Because our partnerships are so tight. So yeah. in New York City, we launched the Joint Security Operations Center with the state. We've got you know a coordinated approach to equities across really what I consider to be a whole of society approach, yeah. which means on our critical infrastructure side, our private sector partners, if we have an ongoing phishing campaign that we're seeing, we're sharing, okay, look for this in your mm -hmm. um, email system. And because of that, that's our value add. We actually, we get partners telling us what's going on in their yeah. environment. Um, we're not a regulator in that sense. We really are. Um, Just a pure partner. We're a partner because it's shared fate. Yeah. We have this interconnected New York City. We're a smart city where delivery of services to New Yorkers, they can't go down. Right. Um, and nobody's it's not going, an option. It's not, it's not an option. Yeah. And nobody's going to wait five minutes pointing fingers about whose fault is it when something bad happens. Uh, it's, it's our collective yeah. to not let that happen. Mm -hmm. And that resiliency of bringing the you know, continuity of operations folks in, the public yeah. safety folks in, we have the close partnerships as FBI, NYPD, CISA, right? So everybody knows our mechanics before the potential yeah. incident occurs. Um, it has really helped and continues to help. Um, and that, that sort of what I consider to be like the double click operational yeah. insights of what the products and the visibility that CISA puts out allows us to directly impact so that the residents aren't impacted. Yeah, yeah. So, Robin, what about that? I mean, you know, one of the things that, that you all have implemented at DHS is this idea of a, of a joint cyber defense collaborative, right, the JCDC, right? And there's been a lot of talk about it. It's it's a new model, right, trying to bring people in close together, get the more operational information. Um, there have been mixed reviews, right, generally positive, right? But some some have said as it's, been, as it's expanded, right, there hasn't been as much as many touch points for the newer members, right? Some of the, the bigger players, you know, uh, Alicia mentioned that, you know, the FBI has got this sort of small group of the top few hundred companies, right? Um, can JCDC scale? Um, and if it can, can it get as operational as what Kelly's talking about in terms of getting real actionable insights? You mentioned that yourself in your conversation about how that's really what you need to give people. It's one thing to say, keep doing multi-factor, right? But it's another thing to say, here's something you need to go look at now, tomorrow. Um, is it scalable? And if so, how how do we do we see it going across the country, state, local, regional? Is that going to work? I think it. I mean, it does. I think it's 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 obviously in its nascent stages in the grand scheme of things, um, but I think it's it's got the right at 
uh, atmosphere of companies, I think it is very much a network of networks in that we originally targeted, right, the kind of the biggest infrastructure pipeline um, uh, folks, right, the companies that had the biggest prevalence across the country yeah. so that we can have that scalability. I think we are maturing in a way where we're doing joint coordinated planning because I think joint planning creates joint buy-in to an event or to an incident. And so yeah. the result and the products that come out of it are going to be more useful as a result. Right? Yeah. And so I think we're now working with our partners to understand where the demand is, where they want to go about campaign planning, identify a project that they can do together, and then go down that road together. I think there have been a couple of really good examples. I think um, you know, working on things like the Log4j vulnerability as vulnerabilities and incidents become increasingly more complex. They need yeah. that kind of centralized mouthpiece coming out of the government. We did some uh, things where we were creating GitHub repositories so folks could find you know, um, compromised instances of Log4j and various software. Um, and I think we're, we're becoming more targeted as well. I think we've had some really good success stories where foreign partners have been using JCDC as mm. well and coming to us. Um, We've worked with private sector folks to identify multiple nation state malware on state and local and international partner networks. And so through JCDC, we've done those notifications. Huh. Um, and you know, I think to, to everyone else's point, like we are plugged in too with the interagency. Everyone realizes that FBI and CISA and NSA, they're all kind of doing their own things. There are multiple centers um, where folks are liaisoning with the private sector. But I think we're doing a better job internally of plugging those holes as well so that we're one unified federal apparatus. So I do think there is some success there, but I think we're breaking the model a little bit. And I mean, I think, you know, we all know in this like government culture and, and the way we've operated has been um, the same for many years. And so that is a tough thing to, to break through the bureaucracy and, and really get through it. But I think so it's yeah. starting to get there. And folks, we'll, we'll definitely take questions here in the next, the next five, 10 minutes. So please have your, have your questions in mind. Um, but, you know, Arang, let me ask about that, because, you know, one of the things that we heard from the Cyberspace Solarium Commission and the like is the need for a fundamental rethinking about the way we the way we look at cyber defense in the country. Right. That it needs to be a shared responsibility between the public and private sectors. There needs to be this operational collaboration. And a lot of what we talked about today is, you know, some ways of doing that. JCDC, right. Shields up. Right. There's collaboration between the federal, the states, the locals, the regionals, private sector companies. But have we fundamentally changed the way we think about it? I mean, we, are, we, are we moving in that direction? Is it really happening or is that still sort of theory, right? That, yeah, you know, information is being shared, but, you know, it's not, we're not really, we don't really operate as one when it comes to the public and private sectors in particular. I mean, how do you, how do you think about that? And if it's, if it's true that we haven't really fundamentally changed it, is that change possible? That's a good question. I mean, I think it's an evolution, right? Like we are slowly evolving there when you and part of that is the responsibility of the government in terms of how we operate, right? Yeah. I think we have changed the model. When you go back to looking at some of the incidents I helped manage when I was at the White House, we definitely took different approaches, right? With the Microsoft Hafnium exchange hacks, we did we stood up a unified coordination group, we had Microsoft at the table with us at, yeah. the, at the White House making uh, decisions, helping us understand the incident, working hand in hand with government. I thought that was a really effective way that slowed down, that sped up a lot of decision making and cut through a lot of bureaucracy on both ends, having that higher attention paid. To and was it. it was it at senior levels that you had Microsoft engaging? We had at senior and operational levels so yeah. we could kind of deconflict gotcha. across both of them. So, yeah. you know, I think that was an interesting model. And, and we 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 started to kind of show that we are more interested in doing this. Likewise, I think there is um, there is a value statement that the private sector needs to have that we've been hammering, right, which is more around shifting the burden of these cybersecurity incidents away from the user and more towards those that are most uh, resourced and technically capable of, of, um, of fixing them, right? And so thinking through the role of big cloud service providers, of big industry reps who have bigger pieces of the pie who can drive more scalable solutions so that government and private sector are not kind of in the weeds on every little incident, but that the private sector can knock out some of those bigger issues, but secure by design, secure by default principle of doing code review and yeah. hardening their systems more. So I think there's a give and take on both sides that needs to happen. I do think it is slowly getting there. Look, I don't think it's gonna be perfect overnight. And I think this is, we're chasing, we're chasing something that's continuing to move, right? Incidents are getting, becoming increasingly more complex, but I think if you're looking at the collaboration, the way we're 
filling the gaps. I think it's night and day from even five years ago. Yeah. Um, so it's slowly closing that gap. Yeah. I mean, Alicia, do you do you see it that way? Do you see? Do you feel like it's it's a very different environment than it was when you were um, in the government in the military? Um, does it look different? Sit on the private sector side. Do you do you feel like things have changed over the last? Years you've been in the private sector, you've been in a number of big mm-hmm. companies, Accenture and the like, um, uh, Cognizant. How, how, do you feel like it's changing? I do. I agree with everything that he said, actually. I, I've seen it. No, it's not like, I wouldn't call it glacial speed. You yeah. Know, but I mean, we're talking about the federal I, I government big companies. I mean, right, in New York you know, City. We're not talking about, uh, you know, the most agile, rock out startups in the Silicon <laughs> Valley. It's, it's noticeable. And I'll tell you, um, I agree. I was really happy to see when we have these you know, events that impact like thousands of companies. Like, yeah. You know, the, the one he's talking about, Microsoft and Log4j. I mean, there's hardly a company that wasn't impacted by that, right? So yeah. it's good to see when they are actually, the government is actually collaborating with the vendors who are the ones that are, you know, actually handling it operationally mm-hmm. with all the other private companies out there and, yeah. and the rest of government that's impacted by it. So I definitely see that. And I also, too, again, it seems like I'm giving a lot of kudos to the FBI today, but they started a CISO Academy, and I actually was one of the yeah. first people to go through that. Yeah, yeah at yeah. Quantico, and um, it's not to teach us how to be a CISO. It's, it's really more to put the confidence in, pub, in, in private company CISOs to want to work with the federal government. Yeah. And I already was a fan because I'm from that right. space, so right. it wasn't a hard sell, but I saw a lot of guys that I work with in the private sector that just loved going through that and loved the, the data that they were giving us because there was actual, um, you know, probably was, you know, classified with a declassified to give it to us and t- talk to us about huge operations that were going on yeah. globally, not yeah. just in the United States. Yeah. These, these cyber attacks are global things that they have to contend with. And it was really, you know, exciting to work with them. And, uh, and I do see from the day that I stepped out of the government in 2012 when I retired over to the wild side over to the private mm-hmm. sector side. And it's just, interesting that you, that you, going from the government and the ar- the U.S. Army working with cyber operations to going to the private sector is the wild side. I don't, yeah. you, gotta, you gotta tell us more about yeah, that. Yeah, I would, I would consider, well, you know, on the, on the government and federal side, there's a lot of compliance requirements and things mm. that you mandatorily have to comply with. And I kind of, uh, I kind of like that, you know, because... Don't say that. Iran is listening, and the yeah, White House is interested in doing that. So don't, yeah. I'm not sure I'd say that out that loudly. Well, I mean, it was it. what it did is gave you consistency in right. your environments, and yeah. everybody was working on the same mission, walking in the same direction. You get in the private sector space, and it's like every company is different, really. You know, I mean, uh, companies are driven by what market they're in, if they're in the financial space or in their healthcare space. I mean, you're super vigilant in those spaces. You know, they're, they're, they're pretty regulated in some ways. Yeah. But, uh, but I consider it, you know, there's a lot, a lot of free play out there to do, you know, what it is that you, that you want to do as a company. But um, I think you'd ask me yeah. one other question. I mean, it's, I think it's, that's, that's helpful. You know, one of the things I wanted to ask Kelly about, though, was, you know, one of the things you mentioned, Kelly, was it's not just about the systems. It's about the people, right? Yes. And and I know that everyone, you know, thinks about the workforce challenges that we face in this country, particularly in the cyber domain. Um, I know New York's got a big effort in this space. Tell us about what yeah. you guys are doing on the workforce side and how you're working with partners to get to get that that issue addressed. Yeah. So we um, earlier last fall we launched the first ever cyber academy across New York City. Um, so when the uh, mayor Adams took over and the administration changed, he immediately prioritized cybersecurity by releasing a couple of executive orders. One of which instantiated every city agency established a cyber liaison that was not the CIO or the CISO, and that was for a reason, right? To have a force multiplier, an additional set of hands, a dedicated person who could work with us more directly on operational matters. And so what we did was build a program really focusing on upskilling, reskilling those cyber liaisons. And you're talking about folks who are city employees who may have come from the help desk, who may be an IT, you know, focused on IT rather than cyber, yeah. how do you get them to a cybersecurity incident response background? And so we modeled the training on the FBI's program to upskill or reskill um, new new agents going out to the field to work cyber cases. Interesting. So really, really focused on the priority on the incident response skills. Mm-hmm. Because what do we need more of? We need more folks understanding how to work an investigation um, and be a partner to us yeah. and be that multiplier for us. And it's been really, really successful. And, you know, workforce development 
it, it's not easy. Um, we have a lot of great. It's um, not popular to talk about it either, it, right? No, I mean, I mean, it's it's the hard work that you know your your team and your as an individual you have to sign up for this yeah. cybersecurity profession, which arguably can be glutton for punishment in a in There's a no way. There's no winning, right? You typically can't say you're done right. really ever. You're never done. Exactly. So how you know we we gave the tools to succeed to, to these folks. We have our um, we graduated them in, in April from the yeah. um, inaugural class, and we're going to focus on the remaining cyber liaisons. We're finishing up our second cohort, and we'll have another one in the fall. And you know we have this big celebration for them at the end of it because they're they've gone through weeks and weeks and weeks yeah. of this training, and really put the time in. And it's not the end of their journey, right? You have to keep upskilling, keep reskilling. Fresh, yeah. And the goal really of Cyber Academy is to be a, a pipeline path and. Mm -hmm more for not just city employees, but also folks across the city who are looking to get into cybersecurity, looking to get into the field at any stage, um, because I, I do think cybersecurity can be a unifier, yeah. right? Do you, no, keep going, you, sorry. You don't, need, you don't need a college degree. Yeah. I think I think some of the best people that we know in the field don't have a college degree in cybersecurity. Is that right? Because they didn't exist many, many moons yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. Sure. And a lot of times we, we interview folks who have those degrees, but have never, built a system yeah. or deployed a scanner or don't fundamentally know how it works because they've never done it. Um, and so giving them the real world skills yeah. is really the focus. We, you know, prioritizing reality of cybersecurity yeah. um, day to day. And so it's been, it's been really successful and we're just going to continue yeah. to grow. Do you, do you worry about losing those people? You're giving them all this training, all this skill set, and there's a huge private market for cybersecurity yeah, professionals. Yeah, but why would I waste my time worrying about that? I think, yeah. I, I really do think you're, we're, we're, regardless if they stay or they leave for any yeah. duration of time, they're learning and they're going back into the community and yeah. somebody else is going to get somebody yeah. great. And then maybe go. they'll come back to me. Yeah. I, I consider folks who transition from New York City Cyber Command as an alum, alumni, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. right? We have a, a cohort of folks. Some of them were for people that are on the stage yeah. right yeah. here, yeah. Um, which is great because we, we all are trying to solve the same yeah. problem. Um, I'd rather not gatekeep um, all the good work that the teams are doing. and and. A lot of times that means they could come back into a higher level position with more experience, yeah. that diversity of perspective. I mean, I don't think any of us could be really successful and good at what we do as an operator if we didn't have backgrounds in different right. areas, not just government, not just private. Um, and so that's yeah. really what we're bolstering. I, I can confirm I hired someone. Yeah. Is that right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just talking he's, about he's very sharp. He's very sharp. <laughs> and now we work with your office because of that. Right. You know, yeah. It's better. Relationship. Right. Yeah. An investment. Yeah. That yeah. created a connection. So, Ronga, you've you've heard uh, you've heard both Alicia and Kelly talk about the the academies that they've got and they went through. Um, how is are, are you all thinking about this at DHS about how to scale those capabilities, the FBI Cyber Academy, the New York Cyber Academy across? I mean, we've got so many state and locals across the country that are not at the cognizant, you know, or Accenture or New York levels. Um, and, you've, and you've got, you know, water districts and power districts. And I mean, these are small oh, yeah. rural organizations, rural telcos, you know, but all of which, you know, are providing critical services to their area. And a lot of which, you know, I mean, you know, our system is resilient, but only to a degree, right? You know, some, you know, failures in small parts of the system can cause, can trigger cascading effects across the system. Are, are, is there a way to deliver that capability at scale? Again, I realize I keep coming at you on the scale question, yeah, yeah. but you guys have the federal responsibility. So like, is there a way to scale that training and workforce mission out there across our state, local, regional, tribal territories? I mean, I think the power of the federal government is the power of our purse. I think we yeah. have a lot of resources that we have that we can make available, right? I think obviously we have regional personnel that go out and they conduct you know, incident response and they do victim notifications and they're engaging with with entities, but if you zoom out a little bit and look at some of the broader things that we have, uh, we recently have um, been given over a billion dollars from Congress in a, what's called the Cybersecurity State and Local Grant Program. Yeah. And so this is the ability to disperse funds directly to state governments to use on cybersecurity and cybersecurity resilience for the critical services that they provide. They put together a plan, they put together a package, um, it has to be submitted and our cybersecurity folks review it, kind of make sure that the plan kind of makes sense within the, the requirements, that it's hitting all the needs, uh, and then we're starting to disperse money. I think we've gotten, I think, over 50 different um, um, proposals, including um, states and territories and things like that. 
Right. Um, so we're in the process of reviewing them and then kind of constantly iterating. It's the first time. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll disperse money in the next year uh, throughout the year and then take a look at how that is being spent and kind of refine it, create additional um, advice and guidance in terms of what folks should be considering and looking yeah. at. And, and then we'll kind of continue to iterate. But I think that's going to be, uh, to your point, one way we can look at really scaling some of these resources because it is a shared burden for awesome. a lot of states. Awesome. Well, I did say we go to the audience for a question. So I see a question back here. Yeah, please. Yeah, hi. Thank you for the opportunity. I was going to ask, like, uh, what do you think about the role of like, CISA in the building of the uh, nation's like, cybersecurity infrastructure? And do you think like this, uh, the role of, uh, like, basically, do you think that are they doing their role and they can uh, achieve their duties pro properly? What kind of role do, should they assume uh, in the building of the infrastructure? Sure, so I mean, I think at the, at the end of the day, CISA and DHS works broadly with a number of company, uh, countries, sorry, and international partners. Um, and it's not just CISA, we at DHS have broad international agreements and cooperation partners in cybersecurity along many of our mission sets, including uh, aviation cybersecurity through TSA, mm -hmm. maritime cybersecurity through the Coast Guard, all of which are parts of the department. But I think, you know, I think CISA's first and primary interaction with foreign countries is that indicator sharing, right, treating an uh, international partner very much like a private sector partner in that we have actionable intelligence, we have the ability to give information about threats that they're seeing. I think we have some limited capacity to go and um, help when we're going abroad. I know FBI does it as well, um, and others to go kind of advise and help um, uh, when there are threats. I don't know that there are necessarily, you know, the resources to rebuild a system and the kind of technical and legal hurdles for that do present some challenges. I don't know that that's necessarily their primary mission, but I do think we increasingly acknowledge that, you know, the security of the whole system is um, very much dependent on other countries having safe systems, right? I think. It's been really interesting even over the last few days and weeks looking at things like um, the movement vulnerability, right? As these global campaigns are happening, you actually see exploitation happening in real time in other countries that are even solving some of those before we wake up. Mm -hmm. And so for you know someone like CISA to wake up with really good foreign um, partners that are already sending them remediation guidance, are already sending them warnings that they can repackage, bundle with ours, and then shift back, it's, it's creating a very collaborative environment. So I think it's very focused on you know, defending the infrastructure that does exist, um, and then thinking through how we can support it as more of a whole of government, because I think that type of aid you know, involves USAID, it involves the State Department, uh, maybe even defense aid uh, in certain contexts. So I think we're definitely part of those conversations, but also primarily focused on the defense part. You know, CIS is a new agency, uh, Kelly, um, and do you, do you think that New York City needs a CISA analog? CISA analog? Yeah. I don't know. I think, um, I think the, the interesting part about SLTT, again, having come from the federal and living, living and breathing FISMA, yeah. Yeah. which is the rule of the land here, um, in SLTT and arguably what you mentioned in the, the private sector, we, it's it's a regulatory framework and overlay yeah. that's so specific to where you're located and local law versus potentially overarching. That Venn diagram is super important. So when you when you look about how how CISA is engaging and promulgating this information across, it has to be what it has to be for everyone to yeah. consume in the way that they need to execute on it. Um, but you'd be surprised I, I, across SLTD, especially small entities. Right, New York City is a little bit different. Folks may not know what 853 is, mm -hmm. nor are they going to learn a 350 control list, mm -hmm. right? They're not going to have an our, our version, FISMA version of an authority to operate. So yeah. how do you get to like light touch regulatory cybersecurity that's the spirit of security, not just a compliance check? Yeah. And that's the delicate balance, I think, when you're talking about going even out to private, right? You've got PCI compliance and, and this compliance, and you have to find your way kind of through those different guidance yeah. or these different documentation. And there's a plethora out there, not just from vendors, but from CISA, from FBI. Um, <laughs> getting hooked into those is, is critically important. So I think yeah. that's really where the rubber meets the road and SLTT sort of demystifying 
how to get to secure fastest, knowing you can't, you can't, you have to prioritize, yeah. so right? This is yeah. this is the exact problem set that we've tried to address through something called our cybersecurity performance goals, mm. which are essentially voluntary measures, but it's almost like a whittled down version of if you are an under resourced kind of mom and pop shop, you don't have all the resources you need, you know, where can I get a minimum based on security, and then how do I scale that up slowly? We've created kind of a, a performance outcome based. Um, a set of uh, controls that you can do. They're aligned with the whole NIST framework. You're getting what you need, but there's some there's some ability to modify in there, and it's it's tailored towards folks who may not have all the resources immediately. So encourage folks. And do you find there's uptake in that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And we're going out back in the field. Where so two things. One, where we we put them out. They went through pretty big industry consultations. So folks chimed in on them a lot. And then we're going to go back and do a review uh, based yeah. on implementation. And then we're also creating ones that are specific, more specific to each sector. Cool. And you're also yeah. you're also noticing too, and I've got to give you all kudos for it because when they came out, I took a hard look at those in comparison to our operations, thinking through, okay, is there any diff here? Yeah. Um, What'd you find? They're good, yeah. right? right? And they're good yeah. because a lot of those work streams we've had in place for a while at scale, yeah. and all of a sudden the federal government came out with the thing we are doing, but to do with everyone. Writ large, um, yeah. And, yeah. and it was really awesome to see a product that you could hand in plain language right. to someone, right? We have entities that come to us a lot and ask for help. And we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. We need to point them to where the the invention came from and say, this is the guide. This yeah. is your this is your start here, focus cool. here. Um, and so it's been really exciting to have some of that material available to promulgate the community because that's where the force multiplier for right. the CISAs of the world yeah. and, and FBI and partners alike that are putting together some of that documentation. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, the back, yeah. Hey, I have a question for Kelly. Um, so have you found at sort of the operational level that there are specific tools or that work better as shared services models than an associated thing? Because you do things for yes. your locals as well, right? Mm -hmm. so Yes, yeah. absolutely. I think um, s there are certain capabilities, security capabilities, obfuscating sort of the tool specific, but capabilities that are unifiers in the space that you can deploy rapidly and at scale that do move the needle in the most critical areas you need. EDR and point detection and response is absolutely one. MFA, as a shared service? As a shared service. MFA. Mm-hmm. MFA for sure. Um, again, making sure that you're promulgating identity management in the right right way, um, and this also allows for a flexible architecture as well. Um, I think security awareness, folks standing up and maintaining, training. Yes, yeah. standing up and maintaining a, a system to do that for yourself versus somebody providing that. Um, is always a, something that we find folks enjoy. We're offloading sort of the back end work that teams might not have the, the resources, the yeah. staff, or the expertise to do, and we're giving them the closest to an easy button as possible. Yeah. So those would be some of the ones that, for sure, as, as part of a shared service works for us in New yeah. York City. Well, so what about for you in the private sector? What, what, what operations have you found, at least for like your different business units? Like what, what's better as a shared service? What's better for them to figure out on their own? Yeah, so um, good question. I think that my style is to, I want to be able to see everything that they're doing and yeah. I want to be able to monitor it and I want to be able to react to it quickly because they don't have the capabilities to replicate what we have. Internally. That they don't have yeah. that. So uh, that's usually the model that I go with is, yeah. is uh, you can call it, I guess it's kind of loosely, you can call it shared services, but yeah. actually taking ownership of that because they just can't, the business on the private sector side can invest in that type of capability so you don't yeah. usually get that good of uh, results out of what they're doing themselves because they can only do what they can afford, yeah. right? So I think uh, moving private companies, yeah. I, I'm a big fan of yeah. letting the corporate level CISO own all that stuff and have that visibility across a very massive yeah. environment. But what you're doing is you're also driving consistent processes yeah. and products. Like there is so much to be said for consolidating on different product platforms and yeah. being able to get the cost benefit of the scale of that and, yeah. and things like that. So, so wrong on this on this point about shared services and, and, and having a single sort of person in charge, there's been some people who've argued that 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 CISA should be the or or that DHS should have the federal CISO role, right? Should be the federal CISO for all the civilian agencies. 
that they should all report up. If they have their own system, it's fine. But um, what do you, I, I don't want to get you out in front of your, in front of your leadership. So um, what, is, that, is that something you all are thinking about? Is that, is that in the conversation? If it is, what's, uh, what, what, can you, what can you tell us about getting yourself into trouble on that, on that front? No, I mean, I'm not aware of that being you know, a high priority or something that's being you know, discussed. Um, I think it's more that, you know, I think you have to acknowledge in the federal government that there are inevitably going to be a lot of players, a lot of cooks in the kitchen, and you need to figure out how they interact, how they kind of work together. I think, you know, the federal CISO has been driving, and I know the office and and Chris really well, they, they drive a lot of really good work. They have unique authorities. They're seeing the budget side. They're also able to mandate in a way that others, including CISA, can't. I know CISA has their binding operational directive. They're able to direct certain things of federal agencies as well. But I mean, I think there's plenty of work to go around. And yeah. so I don't, I don't know that, you know, uh, creating, a, you know, one, one, one single source or one choke point is necessarily the way to need to go. I mean, we need some sort of flexibility. You know, I think, you know, if, if you've seen the, the previous, ver- the current version of FISMA and, you know, whatever is being contemplated, it, these are complicated, yeah, multi, seriously. multi-process kind of things that, that everyone needs to be doing. And yeah, I think they, they, they divided and conquered pretty well yeah. so far. Cool. Um, probably time for more questions. Yeah, please. Or yeah, two, maybe. You. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jose. I'm a student at the University of Chicago. And my question is... I'm an alma mater from the law school. <laughs> yes. Maroon. I'm with the Air School. Sorry. Mm-hmm. There you go. <laughs> my, my question is for, for all the panelists. Uh, you, we've talked about upskilling, scaling initiatives, and shields up. I was kind of wondering, how has inflationary costs affected any of these initiatives, um, both across maybe the public and private sector? Could you speak to what are some lessons learned from the cost of inflation, and how do we prepare uh, to make sure that we don't take steps back? Sure. Kelly, you want to? So, you know, I think in cybersecurity, you always have to be prepared for justifying why you need. Um, I think I really like your comment earlier about being practical about what you need and why you need it. Um, Regardless if you have a board or you don't, you need to be crafting a a story and a message in plain language that you're able to communicate effectively that, that shows what you need, why you need it, and what it's actually going to do. Um, you know, we, we don't, cybersecurity professionals don't need every single tool under the sun. We need our, our toolkit and we need it deployed and configured well and the people to do so um, and, and automation in place. And so I think regardless of the, the fact that inf- inflation is occurring and it is a reality, it is, it, we still have to deliver the same type of content, um, maybe with a little bit different of a price tag, but planning for that and capacity management really no different in my mind um, and so we approach it kind of the similar way let's talk about what the need is let's talk about the, the problem at hand and what's actually going to do if we if we get it in place and ultimately you know it comes down to prioritization you know what's what's more important to fund so there's one last question I think over here do you have a question I did well, yeah. I have please um, Sure. Thanks for the question. I mean, I think it's a, it's a, re- it's a reality, right? You have to, to confront it. There is a, there is a big gap in terms of the things. And I mean, I think, I think to kind of what Kelly mentioned before, there is a certain level of, you know, if we are creating and training um, these types of cybersecurity professionals that originally were in government and maybe uh, go over to private sector, that's not a complete loss for the cybersecurity, cybersecurity community, right? We, if we're having one good cyber defenders on private networks that we've trained you know that's still a net positive for the cyber community and two that is an investment in that it will come back to us with you know competent folks on the other side to share information to partner with us 
uh, you know, I think the government has taken some steps, right? We have matured beyond the traditional GS scale for salaries, right? So uh, we have um, special pay um, scales for cybersecurity professionals through, through um, something called CPMS and uh, CyberPay basically at DHS where we're able to assess someone's technical skills and pay them, you know, you know, north of $200,000, which um, is, like, is competitive, I think, for, for a certain position. Outside the whole GS pay scale? Correct. Wow. Correct. And so it's actually, um, I think they're, they're, they're authorities. Sign up for Congress. that. Cyber pay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think, you know, and, and it's incorporated in CISA. Um, I think we have the authority, too, within our CIO's office. So, like, the ability that, to have good defenders of our federal networks as well. Um, we've tried to increase the pay somewhat, um, so I think you know that is something that that's increasingly closing the gap. But at the end of the day, like you mentioned, we kind of hang our hats on the mission, right? The work that you get to do is unique in the government and and really interesting, in my opinion. And I think those are still people worth investing in. So you know, we'll we'll continue to kind of get after that issue. But uh, if you feel like applying, feel free to do so. Mm-hmm. Any additional thoughts from you? Yeah, Lisher? I definitely. There's a pay disparity between the government side and the private sector side because it is huge on the private sector side. And I think that we we don't really struggle with people wanting to leave to go to the government side. They're, they're leaving to go to other like companies and they're going for 10, 15, 20, 25% more. So what we struggle with is retaining people. So we, we do a lot of retention bonuses and we give them, and it's short too. Like we're gonna, we're gonna give you this much money if you stay for one year and it's like almost year to year because it, it just keeps on the pay scale just keeps moving up in cyber wow. it's really hard to keep people I, w- hard. I will sorry to cut you off but mm-hmm. one thing we do have that we did not mention you get job security with us <laughs> there's inflation yes, if there is right, right. stability <laughs> in the market not much of a concern that is stability a comes back yeah. <laughs> yeah. that is yeah. a fact that I've, I mean we've, we've done a little bit of hiring can and anecdotally we've we've heard some folks you know, it's mentioned that they're interested more now because of the stability that a government um, yeah. cyber job can we offer. Too. Kelly, any last thoughts from your end? I, I would agree with both of you. Uh, we've, we've seen this interesting sort of um, life cycle of folks, you know, post pandemic really looking for, I think, a greater appreciation for work life balance, right? Yeah. And some fully remote options, right? And so sometimes we've, you know, we have folks that, you know, are able to double their salary, triple their salary, go out in the private sector. But then oddly enough, what we're seeing even in the last year is, you know, unexpected layoffs from all stars, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Stars truly la- laid off at, due to unfortunate circumstances beyond their control. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, oh, I, I think I want to get back in, into government. So it, it's very interesting to watch. And I think we'll continue to see that, that cycle um, as the next few years materialize, right? We're living in a very different world. Uh, but it is exciting to see some more folks interested and excited in the mission space. Yeah. So great. Well, so two things. One, please join me in thanking our, our panelists for being here. And then second, uh, we have another event coming up on Friday uh, that's in two days from now, June 23rd, from 10 to 11 at Brownstein LLP downtown. Uh, NSI fellow Jane Lee will be leading a conversation on the debt seal and defense budget. What's next for FY24? It'll be in person and also live streamed on national security gmu.edu and next Wednesday, June twentieth, the day after my birthday, uh, from three to four p.m. NSI Fellow uh, will be hosting an event on five G to six G international perspectives on U.S. spectrum leadership. That'll be on Zoom again, available at nationalsecurity.gmu.edu. There's plenty of food in the back, so if you have uh, coworkers that like you want to take food back, please take it. Um, it's back there for your uh, refreshment. And uh, once again, thanks all for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.